afternoon, good whatever time of day it is. Thank you for tuning in to Conversations with Dr. Don. From the Tualatin Valley Community Television Studios in beautiful green Beaverton, Oregon, we bring you the Conversations with Dr. Don show. Now, for your first-time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind individuals and about whatever it is that we decide to talk about. Now, tonight's guests are, to my left, John Polding, an old friend of mine <laughs> who's been on the show before, and I keep bringing him back because you never get enough of him. <laughs> and to my right is Kalki, a friend of John's, who I met a few times before, and his history and what he is about is so interesting until I thought we would have him on to talk about what he is about. And John's going to help me talk about the Tao of body and the Zen of mind. And I'm not sure what that's about, but we're going to find out tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So how are you, John? I'm great. How are you, Don? I'm good. good. Kind of tired, but good. Yeah. <laughs> and how are you, Kalki? Great. Thank you. Good. Yes. Now, the show typically goes in about two major segments. The first segment is usually what I call the bio segment, where we talk about uh, who my guests are individually, a little personal stuff. And then we go into the subject uh, of the show, which is the Tao of Body and the Zen of Mind. We have a cheat sheet here with a couple of uh, things listed that would prompt us to have the conversation go in a coherent way so that we can all follow and be uh, what's going, uh, with what's going on. But first of all, Let's have John tell us a little about who he is for those first-time viewers out there. John Poling, who are you? Oh, I've been around Portland a long time. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, actually, I went to Benson back in the 50s mm -hmm. and did a little real estate and development after that. Uh -huh. And then in the 90s, I started publishing Community Connection, and that's still on the Internet, communityconnection.com. Mm -hmm. And what are you doing now? Well, I keep thinking I'm retired. <laughs> That'll be I the day. I don't think it happens. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have a lot of projects. I uh, hold a monthly meeting for real estate professionals, mm -hmm. hold another monthly meeting for alternative currency. We now are referring to it as complementary currency because they don't stop using the dollar. And uh, that's uh, a monthly meeting. Actually, we have two meet meetings that we have one in uh, Johnson Beach and one on the, the sleigh bells. So uh, uh, I like that one because it rounds out my real estate experience, looking to see how they created. And wow, well, have we ever learned how they created it? All this stuff on television now that the banking went upside down, and I finally got to look inside of it. <laughs> so uh, is your operation going to turn upside down like the banking system in America? You just can't be doing much right now. It's brought it to a standstill. Uh -huh. yeah. So how is that affecting your business uh, ongoing? Is it pretty well stuck, or are you doing any transactions well, at all? Well, you can do transactions, you know, projects that you uh, already have pending, but there are no, no new projects starting unless you're you know, really well established with the banks. And uh, even the banks are in trouble. I mean, it isn't just the builders or just the investors. The banks are in trouble. What's going to happen, John? Well, what Obama would like to do is print a lot of money and bail it all out. We really don't know yet if that's going to work, but that's, that's what they're working on. And you think about it, we have to do something. The whole world's rooting for us. <laughs> <laughs> so how soon do you think we'll see the success or failure of his uh, efforts? Will it be a, a year, two, five, Well, nobody years? predicts it in less than a year or two. Yeah. yeah. And it was interesting that uh, China suggested that they have a world currency instead of the dollar. Whoa. <laughs> But that didn't get good news in, uh, in America. Uh -huh. So what part of the 
country do you live in now? You live on? Well, in, in the greater Portland area, uh, Jansen Beach, Hayden Island. That's a lovely I and beautiful day. I have a friend there. with a sailboat over there. <laughs> You've got a rough life, John. Oh, it's terrible. How about your family? You have any uh, kids or family or whatever? They're scattered around Portland, and uh, I have a son in St. John's, and so I'm able to stay pretty much in touch by being in that area. Okay. So shall we go over and talk to Kalki now for yes, a bit? Yes, he's our guest today. <laughs> he's our guest today. <laughs> oh, thank Kalki, you. Uh, that's, uh, where are you from originally? I am from India, uh, from a small town near Calcutta. Near the, Calcutta. Uh, and, and who is called Kolkata now. Uh -huh. And the name of that town is called Puri. Uh -huh. And Puri is very famous in India uh, for uh, the Jagannath temple. And Jagannath uh, is the word that you use as Jagannath, the indestructible force. Yes, Jagannath. That came from Jagannath. Oh, that's so, where it came from. Yeah, and also that's where also this Hare Krishna movement came. The their, Hare their Krishna root, movement? Their root came from that temple. Uh -huh. So that is the temple city where I was growing up. Yeah. And you grew up there? Um, I, I grew up there for um, until 1970, and then I left. And where did you go to? After that, um, um, I must left for my spiritual quest. Uh, before that, I was um, had finished my academic work, there, graduate work, and also I was working as a principal in a high school. Then I became a president of the college, but then I left everything and went for a, went to the Himalayas for yoga and meditation. For a spiritual quest. Yes. What prompted you, after all this success in the academic and, and professional community, to go on a spiritual quest? What prompted that? Well, I, I had two parallel life. Like from my from age of four, uh, my father, who is a great astrologer, he knew that I will be a great spiritual teacher from my birth, from my astrology. So they prepared me two ways. They prepared me. Uh, to go through almost all the great Indian school of thoughts, religious school, so I can have great spiritual training. Uh -huh. And at the same time, I remember from my childhood, they say that one day I'll go to the West, I'll go to the America to take all the message for all humanity. So for that reason, I think they also send me the best, best school, like when I was small, I went to Gandhi school, what Gandhi created himself. It's called the basic school, they send me there. The basic, Gandhi, basic, school, basic school. school of education, yeah. Uh -huh. A very rare school, like maybe in India we have like a, a handful of schools, but they made sure I go there for my first experience of Gandhi gym. And then they send me boarding schools, that means they are very, very good schools. So you have to go far away to stay there and study. So they make sure that I have good study, education. And then when I had good education, I easily got scholarship, I went to school, college, university, and that was no trouble for me at all. So what did you study uh, at the university and all these schools? Philosophy. Philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Especially uh, Eastern philosophy, but I was specializing on yoga and meditation. Exactly what I'm doing now. And what kind of meditation? Yoga. Yoga and uh, meditation. Yoga philosophy, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, wow, I'm going to hear some more of that later mm -hmm. on. So you have this parallel, this two uh, paths in your life, but then the spiritual quest, you abandon the, the being a principal of the school and all that and, and the president of the college, yeah. So w what did you do in your spiritual quest? Did you, the, the Gandhi? Well, uh, the talk, talk some more about yes, that if right, you will. Right. Well, as they knew from my astrology that I will be a great spiritual teacher, so they started teaching me scriptures, like Hindu scriptures, mm -hmm. which is written in Sanskrit. Uh, they started teaching me from the age of four and five, when I was very small, even though I have, I have not gone to school. And I remember the room where I sleep, it is filled with palm leaves, starting from the Vedic and Upanishad period, like starting from 
2500 BC, those generation of writings and not written on paper, but on palm leaves. It is filled all around me, so that I will be interested to study them and do deep, go deeper and deeper. So, in other words, they created all the environment I need to go uh, in this field. Because of your father's conviction. For, 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 for from my astrological, yeah. And then, after that, when I grew up, they sent me all the important schools uh, for uh, religious training, you know, like school from Yogananda came out of autobiography of Yogi and, and this Vivekananda came to America from that school and you can name any school, important school, I went there to study and learn their philosophies. Then when I studied that, like Buddha, then I wanted to experience myself. So that led me to go to Himalaya myself and be quiet for many, many years and meditate and try to understand what is that ultimate reality is, which I got from all the scriptures and schools and now and put together. And like Einstein tried to practice to see that how, what is it, all of them. I'm almost afraid to ask any questions. <laughs> and you can. <laughs> because of, of what you've done all your life. And I'm not sure I know how to ask a question or be available to benefit from your learning and the leadership or the guidance you perhaps have to offer for someone who is available to listen and to learn. Mm. Yes. So what's it all about? It is all about human evolution. Like um, um, what I learned that as human beings are part of the universe, they have to evolve. Just like universe is evolving, you know. Sure. From beginning to end to dark hole. So being part of this universe, human beings are going to evolve. And what is that evolution? It has three parts. It's called physical evolution. Their body has to evolve in the best possible way. Yes. Their mind has to evo evolve in the best possible way. And their consciousness has to evolve in the best possible way. My unique uh, realization of truth will be especially biological because people have already talked about the evolution of consciousness from the beginning and Buddha talked a lot about evolution of mind, but my uh, realization will be how body can evolve, how biologically you can experience all these evolutions, especially when body is the foundation of mind and consciousness. So that is my unique experience I got from the Himalayas, that uh, as our body, most part of our body is atoms and molecules and subatoms, that's so-called nothingness. So most, most, of our part, um, most part of our body is uh, unknown nothingness. Most part of our higher mind is nothingness and also most part of our consciousness is also nothingness. So when you combine this, uh, all these things, the essence of mind and essence of body and essence of consciousness, it is this mysterious nothingness that uh, uh, surrounds everywhere. And that is the most part of our existence. And whatever is we are seeing outside, they are very little, like 2-3%, uh, maximum 5% of our things is matter but other things are atomic and subatomic particles. Then we, we can see the line there, we have a commonality there. Uh, in order to say people that you are mortal, be scared, you are uh, non-intelligent, unwise, so you don't know anything, or your consciousness has evolved, we got the hope that there is everything there. We have two parts. One part is little mortality of uh, visible part, but second part is immortality of all these more than 90% of our thing is subatomic and atomic things, they do not die. Same thing about higher mind, you know, lower mind can change and fluctuate, but in higher mind, you experience that um, uh, bliss or um, what you call tranquility, oneness with the universe, that is possible. Yeah. So that is that's part of immortality. Then of course consciousness, there are seven stages of consciousness, I understood that we people only know like say sleep consciousness, awakening consciousness, or um, dream consciousness pretty much. But beyond to that, we have transcendental consciousness. It can evolve as evolution. We have unified consciousness. We have cosmic consciousness. So one after another, people can develop this thing with the yoga and meditation and can experience that oneness with that mystery, which we call God or Allah, Supreme Being, whatever name we want to call them. So the yogic meditation, all I'm aware of is experiencing. 
So all of these things you're talking about, those are concepts or ideas, but all I can really appreciate is experiencing the moment to the extent that I'm available to experience the moment and not be in the past or anticipating the future. Uh, what's it like on an ongoing basis with you when you're visiting with people like John and I right now and we're talking about stuff and your mind's going and Right now I'm thinking that exactly I'm meditating on your question. I'm thinking that how I can best reply to your question about uh, this um, here and now, how important here and now is in yoga philosophy. Because yoga philosophy does not believe in the future, does not believe in the past. It believes things to happen here and now. And again, also it helps people to transcend from the lower mind. Lower mind means we have an ordinary mind that is connecting to the ordinary world. It says like a stimulus and a response mind, giving and taking. Yes. And so what happens in ordinary mind, we give stress, we get stress, we give suffering, we get suffering, we hurt people, we get hurt from them. So myriads of things we give and we get. So it's continuous um, recollection of those memories, impressions is there. So that's the ordinary mind. So that's why we complain, I have stress, I have anxiety, I have neurosis, and if it is extreme, all these things. But when you go to the higher level of mind, then you transcend that thing to eternal things, not temporal things like love, compassion, caring, sharing, with universal laws, you apply those things. Instead of heartedness, you give love, you get love. Instead of um, um, jealousy, you give them some, your, um, friendliness to somebody. So you just give the opposite things that works, that binds the whole world together. So that's called dharma. Dharma means dharaiti uh, iti dharma. In Sanskrit it's a, that means the one that holds together, that's dharma. And that breaks, the one that breaks, that's a karma. So we do a lot of karma in lower mind, but we do dharma in the higher mind. We give such a things like love and compassion, kindness, caring, sharing and get back also those things and that's called the karmic uh, hypothesis like what you give that you get as you sow so you reap you know in all like we have golden rules in all the yes, other yes. 12 religions so that's that's very powerful thing so then when you learn that thing then you try that's one stage you go ahead uh, being a very suffering human being your degrees of peace and happiness improves because you become the change you want to see in your life so that is the secret. We will not get anything unless we will be past that change. For example, we want to be happy, but we don't want to make others happy. So that's not going to happen. But once we make others happy unconditionally, we'll see that degrees of happiness will improve. So these are some um, uh, important things we have to practice. And then when we practice this, uh, the, the, the knowledge, then that will improve our morality and ethics like universal ethics. There is morality ethics, people uh, call and fight in different cultures, but then also there is universal morality and ethics, say love, it is universal morality and ethics. And sharing, caring, compassion, all these things are universal morality and ethics because that gives birth to this universe. And destruction and hatredness that destroy the universe. So we have two sides of that things. So when you do that, then that part is the evolution from lower mind to higher mind we experience greater degree of peace and happiness. So with your thinking and your teaching, uh, how is that going to impact and affect the behavior of our society and our culture in this country today? What with the election and the new administration and the economic difficulties and all sorts of other difficulties we're having nowadays, I'm gathering that if enough people thought the way that you think and taught the way that you teach, then this would have things turn around. Do you see the kind of changes that we need to happen in this country uh, without the kinds of, of enlightenment and teaching you're talking about? Yes, so that's what, for example, when I teach Gandhi class, you know, in the universities, 
So, I teach this theory, I said this is the first bit the change we want to see and I tell to the students, I said look, if we have a wrong, bad government or wrong government, it is because we selected them, they did not come like dictators. So, we have some responsibility and if you want to change, you can change from the grassroots. You first make sure that right person comes to power and make your support group, your friends and relatives talk and tell to them, when you do this grassroots, you see some change will come because you first became the, um, uh, uh, what is called uh, the root of that change. So, that is how change comes and now we can see the way Obama worked out, we can see clearly that um, that is how it worked out. So, you think it is a positive direction that the country is heading in now? Well, I see a positive thing will be that um, for 21st century, we want this kind of philosophy where we want to see America as a country where all ethnic groups are respected, every human being is proud to be American and they have love and care for the whole world. They do not, they are not the police people to control other people and hurt them, but they are to share their good, good news, who, all the great things they are doing, they can go and share with other people. So, that kind of thing we are learning from history that if they do not make any mistake, they do things other people like in the world. So, then that will be good for America. And if America make mistake like uh, become, uh, become the police person of the world and go destroy other cultures and bump them. So, that reaction of that karma as you are talking is not going to be good for America and we can see that already. Whatever mistake we made, it is already happening now. So, there is no need to give any more examples. We are all right now, we are going in that. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Darwinism and Darwinian evolution such that you are going to have human beings being the way that they are, love, loving and unloving and kind and unkind and uh, I'm just not sure that their philosophy and what you're thinking about is going to make the kind of dramatic change that needs to happen in order for the world to not self-destruct ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yes, what is happening, one thing is very clear. For example, what we are now today in 21st century, we are not the same people in Stone Age people, where everybody is quarreling and fighting, your life is threatened by the animals, you know, you can be killed by anybody, you are attacking anybody, we can destroy anybody anytime you want. So, that kind of life has improved, anybody can see that, we are not the Stone Age people, we are content 21st century. And again, of course, we have not evolved to the full scale, so we have anger, we have frustration, we have uh, that. Uh, uh, development that uh, animal instinct in us, we want to control, just like it, you know, it happens in the forest. But again, with knowledge and growth of consciousness, we are going to grow more and more. Why I am saying that? Because uh, in um, uh, Gandhi class, what we do, I, it will come, uh, I will talk about Gandhi's two children and others, we give them example that even today, 61 percent of our world's problem is getting solved with non-violence practice, many people do not know. Non, that is a great new hope, 61 percent. Mm -hmm. And then that is a great hope. If it is 61, then it can improve more. And secondly, uh, when we uh, did this non-violent movement in the beginning of 21st century, uh, we had uh, uh, processions and parades all over the world, including Portland. That is what we organized here. And uh, Arun Gandhi, one of Gandhi's grandchildren came and we helped him because he did not know anybody. That is how John also did the advertisement in his uh, community connection and articles I wrote, all these mm -hmm. things started. Right. And uh, the goal of that was that uh, during that time, more than 100 Nobel laureates wrote uh, one, one, uh, what is called, uh, a letter to all the leaders of the world asking them the greatness of non-violence philosophy and how they can cooperate so that the world can live in peace. And even though it took 12 years to celebrate that festival of non-violence in the beginning of 21st century, so that it can go out, branch out all over the world, that propaganda, so people can be more benefited. So, all these things are happening uh, because we are slowly understanding the powerful e effect of non-violence. The other reason I can give to will be the collapse of uh, communism, like Le Walsa, his non-violent movement in Poland. S so, yeah, yes, huh? so it again, Nelson Mandela, his mm -hmm. non-violent movement, so it again. And couple of people are waiting like Aung San Suu Kyi in Burma, 
-hmm. Dalai Lama, they are waiting to get the result. So we can see that lot of powerful things are happening by using the non-violent technique. Was even it today, even influenced on Martin Luther King. Of course, back in the '60s. Yeah, yeah. The, what we are talking about Obama now. So Obama picture is only possible because the groundwork of Dr. King. Right. <laughs> no question about it. Well, it's time for us to take a break, and when we come back. Let's pick that up what we we're talking about, and then I will like you to lead what you think we should go in our discussion. Yes. And yeah. we're talking mm -hmm. about uh, Jenna body that of mind. Eh? Gandhi's uh, connection. <laughs> Let me do my break here, all right? <laughs> uh, it's time for a break now for about three minutes. In a moment, we're going to put up on the screen a few panels that show information that you may want to make note of during the break. You may want to get pencil and paper. Let me tell you about the Dr. Don Show broadcast schedule. For you viewers who live in the Washington County part of the Portland, Oregon metro area, Conversations with Dr. Don shows are broadcast five times each week. Typically, a new show is first aired on a Tuesday and is rebroadcast on the following Friday through Monday. You can get Conversations with Dr. Don on the Internet. You can tell your friends to watch Dr. Don shows on the Internet anytime by going to video.google.com and entering Conversations with Dr. Don. We also have an occasional live call-in show. Periodically, a uh, show is recorded live so that you viewers in the Portland, Oregon metro area can call in and give us your say on whatever it is that we're talking about during the show. The next live call-in show will be on Thursday, April something at 8 p.m. in Portland, Oregon the metro area on Comcast Channel 11 and the Verizon Channel 22. Now I want to give you a few key Washington, D.C. phone numbers. If at any time during the rest of the show the thought crosses your mind that you'd like to contact the people in Washington, D.C. who supposedly work for us, the citizens, you can take down the phone numbers that will be up on the screen during the break. Call Washington and tell them what you want and don't want them to do. Most of them really do want to hear from you. So we're now going to put up on the screen the appropriate panels, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Can we put them up now?
Yes, we are back. Thanks for staying tuned. Now, for you viewers who missed the opening of the show, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people, like most of you out there, about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind individuals, and we talk about what we think might be of interest to both us and you, our viewers. To my left is John Poling, an old friend of mine who's been on the show before, and to my right is John Poling's friend, Kauki, who's talking to us about Zen and Tao and yoga and a lot of stuff that I wish I had spent many months learning so I could appreciate a little more because I'm sensing there's something I can experience hanging with you beyond just learning with my brain. So thank you for coming on, Kalki. Thank you. <laughs> so sh where shall we pick up now and... and continue our discussion. What is, shall we follow we'll, we'll, that? We'll, we'll lead towards the, um, um, the root of his yoga, how it started and how it affected the whole Asian continent. And then yes. we came to the West and what's happening in our country now. And finally, how we can use during this difficult time to help people. Excellent, excellent. Um, so this yoga and meditation is a uniquely Indian thing. It started in India uh, around uh, 6000 BC. That long ago? Yes. And then, as we did not have any writing system, they just uh, remembered by listening all those knowledges. Then, uh, when around 2500 BC, they had the first writing system. So, they started writing on palm leaves. So, now we can see that oldest writing system in the world existing in India. And that is describing about the secret of yoga and meditation. So this originated in India? Yes. Yes, okay. Then we, we got great, great spiritual teachers, those who um, uh, did different movements in the school of yoga, like Lord Krishna, he did in the Bhagavad Gita, Buddha did in his lifetime. So they took it another step ahead than mm -hmm. what it was. They advanced the system mm -hmm. of yoga and meditation. After Buddha's death, uh, we see that uh, this knowledge of his yoga and meditation and um, the existence of spirit within us, not outside us, just like Jesus saying that my, me and my father is one. So, but there we see in the ancient scriptures, they said, Swaham, I am that. So, the similarity, it went, uh, it, uh, um, we see in both Eastern and Western after 500 BC, because we know that Alexander the Great came to India um, in 400 BC, and he fell in love with all this knowledge. He was so surprised to see Alexander the Great. Yes, that uh, all this uh, knowledge of the Vedas, the Upanishads, and the, the knowledge of yoga and meditation, great, great mystical yogis and monks and rishis sitting in the Himalayas, even from the research I found. He took a group of yogis to Greek court, all the way to Greek, to show people how powerful they are, uh, along with the scriptures too. Yes. So, in other words, this knowledge of yoga meditation has been already introduced to West through Greece, of course, around 500 BC through Alexander the Great. Then that influenced the other people like Aristotle, Socrates, Pluto. They talked about especially the concept of spirit, not outside there, but within you. That concept changed after five, 500 BC uh, through Alexander's work. Which is what tri Christ said the same thing, you know. Mm -hmm. It's within you. Right. And again, Christ, is, Christ just came 500 years after that. So long time after this concept has been introduced to, uh, to the Greece. And second thing I found through research, that uh, some great scholars, especially a great friend of uh, um, um, this, um, um, what is called Archimedes, who did Eureka, Eureka theory, his best friend, one of his best friend was sent by Greek court, Alexander the Great, to go to India, learn Sanskrit, translate them to Greek, the language, bring them back. 
because Alexander was very fond of those knowledge and wisdom. So, we have two systems. One system in Greece is just Sanskrit, nobody knows scriptures. Another is somebody went from Greek, a great scholar, learned the Sanskrit and knew that and read and translated to Greek and brought back the knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, you can see <laughs> around 400 BC, the knowledge of the Vedas and Upanishads and yoga and meditation is floating everywhere in Greece and affecting people. So, that is the first entrance how it came to um, the western society. But the real meaning of this yoga is coming from like from a English word, it is called yok, y o k e, like joining. When you, to, you plow the land, you know, you put a yoke on the two, -E, two right. Yes. So, yoga means joining, joining the individual essence to universal essence. The technique, the process, the method that helps us to join our individual essence to universal essence, or to declare that I am part of the universe, how to realize that. Instead of saying I am separate from the universe, we are declaring that I am part of the universe, integral part, uh, inseparable part of the universe. So, that is the yoga and meditation. So, in a moment when I achieve that realization that you are talking about, mm -hmm. I have a, a, a sense of this oneness where I am part of this universal oneness, this spiritual feeling. Uh, I'm trying to grasp what it's like to have this realization that you are talking about. Yeah, that is also same thing like as you are saying like as Carl Jung is talking about to archetype. So, this is a great universal archetype in psychological point of view. It is a universal archetype where everybody has a part of that. It goes back to deepest impression of the dark matter and bringing us together. But again, the part, part of this universe is declaring that I want my relationship with the whole. That is the yoke that human beings are part of the universe, but the standing and declaring that here I go, I want to fall in love with that mystery as Einstein is talking. So, that fall in love is this process of yoga. Then what happens that when an individual want to fall in love with that process that he or she has to evolve in certain procedures to do that. He, he or she cannot be disturbed with the mundane things going around, that mind will not help mind has transcended beyond ordinary things what is happening. So, that is called higher wisdom. So, then we transcend from lower wisdom to higher wisdom, we transcend from a, a lower mind to higher mind and that is the mind of the peace and tranquility or we call in psychology mature mind. Mm -hmm. So, from a mature mind we transcend to super mature mind. So, that thing we do not have in western psychology. We all the way go to mature mind, we do not talk about super mature mind, but uh, this process helps us to uh, link that thing from mature mind to super mature mind. That will make sense, a psychological point of view. I'm thinking of, keep thinking of a sense of timelessness. Mm -hmm. When I'm meditating and I am close to this, sense, this spiritual sense of oneness, there is a sense of timelessness. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much time passes from the time where I've achieved that level of awareness. That happens. Say, I will give some example that I say when I teach, I say that wherever your mind sits, that is what it eats. If mind is sitting in a stressful object, that is what mind's ex ex impression. If mind is sitting on peaceful uh, object, that is mind's impression. So, when your mind is, our mind is sitting on um, stress, anxiety, uh, hatredness, anger, all these things, so that is what mind's impression. But if for some reason we know how to take this mind out from there and put in a tranquility, mind can experience that too. So, that is how we learn in the yoga process that how we can use the breathing exercise as a science by taking the deep breathing, we automatically can make our mind calm because they are both are related. Mind and breathing are related. Mind is the consciousness part, breathing is the biological part. So, it is just like equation. For, for example, the slower is the breath, the calmer is the mind and vice versa. So, uh, when people are angry and upset, you can see their breathing is so erratic and fast. And when people are calm, even though they are not meditating, just watching the mountain, sitting by the river, but they are experiencing their tranquility because biologically their breathing is calm. So, that is what the yoga taught us 
that you have to learn a technique where you can make your breathing calm and quiet. And that's why also I like to share with you today that we are having some difficulty now in the countries like um, Malaysia and Indonesia that some uh, um, people are thinking that yoga uh, is perhaps a Hindu thing and it has to be done with mystical mantras and things. Mm -hmm. Some people can uh, narrow down that thing to lower wisdom, but also yoga and meditation can be done without any religion, without any mantra, just by following three scientific techniques that anybody can follow. Three scientific techniques. That's right. I'm all ears. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So now we'll discuss that. So then theistic, atheistic people from all faiths can follow that. The first technique is <coughs> that you are a slowness of breath. We talked a little bit about that. Slowness of breath. Yes. Um, the, um, the deeper we breathe, the calmer we are. So anybody in anywhere in the world, they can try that thing. So we have some technique by which it will help people to understand to uh, have that slower breathing technique. They will re relearn that technique. And another thing, con be consciousness in here and now. We talked a little bit before. When somebody is doing that breathing technique, you can see how it's affecting your body, how your chest is rising, how your lungs are rising, how <coughs> your mind is getting calmer. You become very consciousness in that moment. So that's where your mind is sitting. And make sure that your mind sits on that peaceful breath. Because as you talk to wherever mind sits, that's what it eats. So instead of mind sitting on a stressful breath, mind has to sit on the peaceful breath. The moment mind sits on the peaceful breath, mind's nature changes. So that's the second secret of that. Part. And third thing is that when you are doing yoga and meditation, <coughs> you observe the nature of body and mind and consciousness. So you can transcend. So what is real? What is unreal? What is lower mind? What is a higher mind? How I can transcend from lower to higher mind by following through the uh, my my breathing technique uh, through, the, through the vehicle of breathing technique how I can transcend from lower to upper mind then you can see that you have transcended to such a calm and quiet tranquil place that uh, you are able to connect yourself with the higher inverse rather than being bothered with the disturbance of the lower, lower world and that thing is called samadhi or enlightenment or nirvana, all these words that whenever our evolution is complete, when our mind goes right now, wherever I am, transcends beyond to the stress and anxiety and <coughs> lower thoughts, it goes to deeper, deeper to peace by following the breathing technique, then you can see that mind is capable of thinking the deeper and deeper unified thought, unified I call that unified theory of consciousness. You can unify, even you can transcend from your um, awakening stage to sleep stage to dream stage to transcendental stage to unified stage. All these things can happen to a person if that person is doing the inner reflection by himself, herself. My director just gave me a look and he says, you are not including John. <laughs> John, we must include you or Dennis is going to thump me. <laughs> Thanks, Dennis. Well, you know, I've spent a lot of time with Kalki. And so coming from a strictly Western mind, I've made some observations. And what India has given us is this special insight of focusing. Now, we have religion. I was raised in religion. My father was a minister. But they're talking about being it, not about it, being it. And, and I find it so interesting, and I find the verses in the Bible if you're looking for them. God is within you. He brought up a really interesting observation. I like geography and history, and he said, well, in India, it's Brahmanism. But it all came from the seat of where mankind, uh, intelligence, uh, seat of civilization came from. They call it Brahmanism. You know what we call it? Abrahamism. <laughs> <laughs> it was the same information historically. Uh -huh. But what do we do? We built these great competition. And if you look, 
you'll find a really simple little trick to solve this issue. If it connects you, it's real. If it disconnects you, look out. <laughs> and, and so when these powers, whether it comes from the Bible, whether it comes from the Western, or whether it comes uh, from the Eastern, you'll find there is the love that connects you, the ideas that connect you, the thoughts in your mind that connect you. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Now, as we were looking at the notes, you mentioned the Gandhi connection. Is it appropriate to say something about that now? And we can. So then we can go back to the other topics. Gandhi connection will be that um, um, during Gandhi's time, my father and grandfather were living. So they were connected with Gandhi. They participated in his movement. So that was great. Your father and grandfather. Yeah, yes. When we grew up, then we did not see Gandhi. Gandhi had already passed away. But we heard many, many things from them. But then we had connection with our grandchildren because we are in the same age group. <laughs> yes, yes. So then we came, I came to here and I taught Gandhi subject uh, in many places, Stanford, John Kennedy, and here PSU, Maryhurst, I taught Gandhi class. And they were virtually unknown because they have never come to America. So they just only came starting from uh, uh, 2001. So when they came, they learned from my students who I am and what I do. So through them, they connected to me. Some of my students were organizing this Martin Luther King and Gandhi movement march. So they brought me, uh, they brought them here. And then we recon reconnected again. So they came to our home and spent some time. Then we organized the march uh, here in Portland and workshops. Uh, people came to uh, learn about Gandhi's non-violent philosophy. Gandhi's great-grandchildren? Yeah. One of them is Arun Gandhi, with whom we did non-violent workshop. Um, in our spiritual center for people and also did a big march in the Portland uh, that was Gandhi and Martin Luther King's march uh -huh. uh, from Lincoln High School all the way to Lloyd Center, uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people during that time. And then another grandson who came after that, his name is Rajmohan Gandhi. So he's a scholar. He came to teach a Gandhi class at PSU. Then my student asked him to come to our class to see what I'm teaching. <laughs> because then that's how we get connected. So then he became very happy. So we, we, uh, they were our guests. And then I took them to Powell Bookstore because he had written a new book. He didn't know how to uh, introduce that book to America. So we helped them in the, with Powell's uh, mm. uh, manager. And also, as a gift of their experience, also I did, as I do program at Kebu, um, radio station, yes, yes, an Eastern Cultural Mandal program. So mm -hmm. I did two part work on both of the grandchildren, telling their experience of Gandhi, how they grew up, what, what, whatever people not find from the book. So they told their family story about Gandhi's greatness to all the public. That must have been so, nice. Yes. So these are about all Gandhi connection. And, and then that became part of the Gandhi Samaj. When they came, they knew that we have already started a Gandhi society from 1984, starting from Stanford University, to any place we teach. Every quarter, we, those students become the members of that society. So that's how it grew up. So we've got about four minutes to the left. <laughs> Can you say a few words about what's necessary <laughs> before we stop? Well, I'll t talk about um, that this um, um, Dao and Jain. And Dao means um, your ultimate reality. That's the Dao. And if you want Ultimate to reality. okay, and you, if you want to go and reach that, you have to follow the Zen or the path of meditation. Besides being moral and ethical, you have to do a lot of inner work because that's a big part of human life. So that's how Tao and Zen they all got connected, and that uh, uh, that philosophy became extreme psychology in Japan. Now now they have Morita therapy, they have Jajan therapy, they have Jain therapy. Almost all of their therapy is based on meditation. Uh -huh. and it, it, is, it is giving now 93% of cure rate of mental illness. Whether modern psychotherapy is giving like 67%. So that's an eye-opening thing now. So they are doing all the workshops all over the world now, people learning that how meditation can be a big part of that. Then bringing to our country now, as you know, our economy is collapsing and America's self-esteem is so low now, all time low. 
people are suffering. So, when you teach this method of yoga and meditation, how to reduce your stress and anxiety, how to improve self-esteem, how you can relate to society and family and how you have a better feeling of oneness. Um, so, that will be great thing for America because that is going to be future America. The old America is dead now, finished. Whatever we are, we have to forget it. The new America, the hope and dream has to be based on universalism, has to be based on universal love, have to be united with the whole universe, love, compassion, respect. So, all these things are the basic fundamentals of yoga and meditation, it's not just closing your eyes and sitting. You have a, a, a way of life, it is a personality, you have to develop absolute positive personality of your body and mind and consciousness to be a holistic human being, superhuman being. So, the so then how do we get those people who are living or practicing the opposite of what we are talking about now? Those people who has our society and our culture and the situation that it's in right now. What do we do about those people? They're not going to listen to what you're saying mm -hmm. and people like you. They can see by contrast. Uh, as you are saying, we are doing four ways. We are teaching to families. We are doing the workshops. We are doing the community teaching, in university teaching, all these things. So when uh, this kind of consciousness arises, that will affect just like I say, 61 percent of the uh, world's problem is getting solved with non-violence now. And non-violence is a little part of yoga and meditation philosophy. Mm -hmm. So when people can understand, it's all about ignorance and uh, wisdom. You know, ignorance means suffering, wisdom means happiness. So less and less ignorance is better for us, and more and more wisdom is blessing for us. 61 percent, and we're moving in the right direction. All right, looks like it's about time for us to stop. Again, keep your pens and pencils handy because you may want to jot down something that we will show you in the closing credits. And thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show. And John, you have a closing thought or comment, John? Well, I think you're doing a great job for community. I believe in community and I've watched your work. And you are doing a bang up job. Thank you. And how about you, Kali? Any closing <coughs> thought or comment yeah. for the Closing thought audience? will be, uh, this is my gift to America. I'm always here to teach yoga and meditation to people so that life can be the best it can be. And also we can share many, many more things in the future, whatever they like to learn and the life will be great. So we are always there for everybody to serve them. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing this great so Let's help you. So we invite you to give us feedback, both positive and negative, about any aspect of the show. Uh, I mean, it gives us a better idea of how we're doing. And my email address is friendlydon at AOL.com. And uh, a few public service announcements. I've got to tell you about the ACLU, the American Civil Li Liberties Union. Without the ACLU, I think our civil liberties would be further in the tube than they are now. And the ACLU uh, racial profiling hotline, if you think that you've been stopped by law, over eager law enforcement, I'm not anti-law enforcement, then the ACLU wants to know about it. No, no racial profiling in our country anymore. And the uh, Alliance for Democracy, I've got to tell you about the Alliance for Democracy. That's my favorite organization. A bunch of local activists who are working on important uh, political and social issues that uh, are useful for having America be what it's supposed to be. So uh, uh, before we say goodnight, I wanted to say thank you to Dennis, uh, my director, and the rest of the crew for helping out here and making the show come off the way it does. And I also want to thank you viewers in other parts of the country where you're watching. Thank you for watching. If you live in another part of the country and are watching this show, contact your local community access cable TV studio for information about when they plan to broadcast Dr. Don's shows in the future. And thanks again for coming on the show. Will you come back in the future? Yes. Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, KFC, it's time for KFC. I know you're waiting for it, right? And not Kentucky Fried Chicken. Dr. Don's KFC. Kind. Friendly and charitable. Be kind. Be friendly and be charitable to you too. And you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. 
Thanks again for watching. Good night.